welcome everybody. So today I want to talk about the first 200 milliseconds of HTTPS. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the rest of the 45 minutes I have, but <laughs> um, so we're done pretty quickly. Um, now um, I'm going to talk about a, a few things. Uh, first of all, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the first 200 milliseconds of HTTPS. What's happening when it creates a connection? Um, secondly, I will try and give some tips on how to hardening your setup, how to set up your HTTPS web server. Um, hopefully give you some insights in new and upcoming technologies, um, which may or may not happen in the future. And hopefully show you a little bit about the things you may or may not know already. So um, for everybody who was thinking this is a talk about Heartbleed, it is not. I will show you a little bit about what's happening, but it's not the focus of the uh, presentation. Um, how many of you have actually used HTTPS to begin with? If somebody's not raising their hand, either they are sleeping or... <laughs> if you uploaded a cat to YouTube, you probably have used HTTPS anyway. Um, now, th this talk is actually inspired by a blog post written by Jeff Moser. Uh, here's the link. If you're interested in this stuff, uh, hopefully it isn't you are interested in, take a look at this site. It's a little bit outdated, but still has got a lot of information. I won't go into details today, but still, it's, it's, it's really fun to see it. Um, so before I'm going to start about HTTPS in general, I want to give you a little bit of information about what's happening before that. Um, I'm going to talk about SSL. I think you're all familiar with the term, secure socket layer. Yes, no, a little bit. This is going to be a short but scary history. Um, back in the old days, and with the old days I mean 1994, who is older than that? Younger than that? Are there people born in 94? I always feel old. I think, I'm 94, I can remember that. In 1994, um, a company called Netscape, maybe you're familiar with them, um, they created something called SSL 1.0. This is the time that internet was still very young. Uh, nobody wanted to upload pictures of cats and everything, but still it's SSL was there. Fortunately, considering what comes next, this was vaporware. It's never been released. It's an internal thing from Netscape. February 95, there came SSL 2.0. Finally, a first version of SSL, code name not so secure socket layer, because it was still full of holes. June 1996. Finally, Netscape produced something that was stable enough, secure enough, that could be released out to the public, and it is called SSL 3.0. So this is already two years later. This is the time that SSL, HTTPS, Internet in general, became booming business. Yeah, E-commerce sites came up, things like Amazon, I don't even know if Amazon, but anyway, um, more SSL sites came up, and what they did is there's a group called the IETF, which is like, I don't know what you can call it, like the people who control the internet, like the internet police, but don't really have any powers, like, you know, the Dutch cops, basically. <laughs> they, they took over and they said, okay, we're going to, you know, embrace this SSL, but obviously we can't use SSL as a term because things are confusing as it is already. So we're going to name it TLS. So they took... SSL, they renamed it to TLS, but basically that version, the TLS 1.0, is not really a new version <coughs> of SSL. Actually, it's called SSL 3.1. This will become very confusing later on, because when people are talking about SSL 3.1 or TLS 1.0, they actually mean the same thing. Really confusing. At this point, 1999, there came a whole lot of nothing, until 2006. In 2006, so seven years later, was the next version, TLS 1.1. So not 2.0 or something, smaller bug fixes, uh, security leaks, more new stuff, but not really a whole complete new set. Again, 
2008 TLS 1.2, and this is actually the latest version we are dealing with today. So we're dealing with a version that's from 2008. Um, when was PHP 5.0 released? I think about the same. Yeah, so it's old. <laughs> but this is, this is what we deal with. Well, you see here the, the, the red, the greens, and the yellows. And pretty much it stands for what you should use, should definitely not use, and is okay to use. Green is okay to use. Don't use SSL 3.0 and TLS 1.0. Definitely not use SSL 2.0. Um, there's a site called trustworthyinternet.org. So, you know, what could definitely go wrong there. It actually shows you the connections made on the internet. So when you do an HTTPS connection, 99.6% of that connection actually will accept TLS 1.0. Uh, sorry, SSL 3.0. 99.3% uses TLS 1.0, and only 18.2% and 20.2, 20.7% uh, uses TLS 1.1 or 1.2. So this is really scary. So the best versions aren't really supported that much. And even worse, SSL 2.0, which definitely is a no-no nowadays, 25.7% of the times. This was 2013. Nowadays, it's a lot better. Not by much, but still, it's, it's going up fast. So SSL 2.0 degraded a little bit, which is good. TLS 1.0 and SSL 3 are still up there with 99%. Uh, but TLS 1.2 upped a little bit. And this is a really good thing, because browsers and web servers both are capable of doing TLS 1.1 and 1.2 nowadays. So that number goes up next year. I don't even uh, imagine it, it will go to 50%. So this is a really good thing. Today I'm going to talk about TLS 1.2, so the latest version. Uh, of course, you all did your homework, so you've read RC 5246, right? Everybody get your copy out? <laughs> okay, so basically what it says is TLS 1.2 is a binary protocol. Uh, so it doesn't work the same way as you can do with HTTP, just you know, sniff on the wire and see what's going on. It's, it's binary. It works with different so-called records, it's all kinds of different um, elements inside the protocol, and I will show you uh, later on how it works. Those records have different protocols underneath, and the most important for us is the handshake protocol. Alert protocol shows you when something goes wrong. Change cipher spec is an important one, and application protocol which I will show later again. So what I'm going to do today is actually show you what's going on when you go to a HTTPS website. So if you type in your browser HTTPS and the, the URL up to the point that you actually get something from it. And what's happening is that the client and server do all kinds of callbacks to each other. So client goes here, then the server responds, then the client responds, server responds again, and finally you can get your request on a secure line. So these are the things that happens in the first 200-ish milliseconds of HTTPS, and I will try to go there you know, step by step to show you a little bit what's going on. I will do some live wire sharking. Um, it's not completely live because <laughs> I don't really, really want to do it completely live. Uh, I just did a screen grab of a uh, URL grab before. So this is what happened, I think, 15 minutes ago. And I'll show you a little bit what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to do is the client hello part. So that's the first thing what's happening. I hope you can all see this. Does anyone know what Wireshark is? Has anyone used Wireshark before? OK, so I don't have to explain, explain how awesome that tool is, right? OK, so what I will show you, and this is going to be a little bit hard because I have to look at this screen. What is happening here is that I create a connection to the server with a client hello protocol. And I'm going to skip all the information about TCP IP and, and all the things that are happening there and focus on the top layer, the secure socket layer, the SSL. They keep mentioning SSL and TLS together. It's, it's all you can you know, exchange that. Now the first thing you're going to see is that it's a certain type, namely our handshake protocol. 
and it's got a version, version TLS 1.0. And you see in binary that it's encoded as 0301. That stands for SSL 3.1. You know, this is the confusing part. Inside that handshake protocol, there's a whole lot of information about things that the client will send to the server. I won't go to all of them, but the funny thing is that here it says, oh, this thing is from TLS 1.2. So it uses all things together. You know, it doesn't have to be that confusing, but alas, it is. One of the most important things is that you see here some kind of random number. And that random number consists of a Unix timestamp, basically uh, an, a date, and some random time, uh, random bytes. How many of you have ever tried to create something random in PHP? Okay, how many has tried to create something random in PHP for cryptographic purposes? Okay, don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, generating randomness is, is really hard if you want to do it for cryptographic purposes. And this is exactly what we want to do. This is all cryptography. Uh, because randomness is not really possible on a computer. Computers are deterministic, so you can't really do anything random. That's why it's called pseudo-random. What we need to get something that looks like it's random it's called entropy. Entropy is basically uncertainty. We get all kinds of different sources that makes our formulas much more random. Uh, does anyone know entropy sources which you could use? Anyone? Network interrupts, interrupts, yeah. mouse interrupts. Yeah, yeah. Every, everything that's, that's not, not deterministic you can uh, use. How about time? Yeah, the time by itself is really not a very good entropy source. If you look into the PHP uh, core, that's pretty much the, not completely the only source they use, but the most important source they use. PHP is very bad when it comes to entropy. It pretty much doesn't really do that right. Uh, things like s round micro time is perfect if you want to decide if your site needs to be blue or needs to be red. You're perfectly fine with that. If, you can, if you're going to use something like this to generate salts for your passwords, to generate passwords or something else, don't. Don't even try to do that. These are equally bad. Rand, empty rand, a unique ID. There are some good ones though. There is a called, uh, um, something called open SSL pseudo-random bytes that generates strong random numbers you can use. Actually, there is an option that says uh, if it can't use it, it, it will return information that it could not use strong bytes. But overall, that's a really good way. Uh, you could also read, if you're on a Linux system, for instance, uh, from dev random or dev uh, random, which are random sources created by the Linux kernel that does all kinds of different entropy sources. So that's a good one. Another way is use a hardware random number generator. Basically, it's, it's something hardware, and you can stick it in, and it will generate numbers for you. They take things like you know, cosmic radiation and, and things like that. So you know, you're pretty safe if you use something like that. This one is nice, too, a million random digits. Anyone know that? It's a book. It's created somewhere in the 1950s, and it's a book with literally a million random digit numbers. It's created by uh, a roulette wheel, but they used it in the old days to calibrate new random machines. So if they created new random machines, they could actually see if the numbers are random enough by checking that against this book. It's republished in 2001. You can actually look at it at Amazon. Uh, Please do, not now, but after the talk, um, because it's got all kinds of funny comments on them. Um, if you ha don't have enough on a one million random number of uh, random digits, there's actually a sequel. It's, it's literally called a million random digits, the sequel. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, there may be a movie for that later on, but uh, <laughs> now it's read the comments, it's just too funny. Uh, but yeah, you know, they used that in the old days. Another real good thing is um, a library called RandomLib 
from Anthony Ferrara, Eric Maxwell. I think most people know them. It's, it's, he's one of the you know, big guys from security in PHP. And he created a library which allows you to create secure numbers or a little bit less secure numbers or even weak numbers depending on how fast you need to, uh, need to get them. So really take a look at this library if you want to do random numbers more securely than you know, what PHP does. So yeah, random numbers, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to create them. But fortunately, it has created that for us. And now we can continue. Um, I'm going to skip a few things, but I will come to the cipher suites. And the cipher suites is actually a list. In this case, there are 20, 20 suites here that tells the client to the server, listen, these are the different security measurements I know of. This, these are the different ways of to encrypt data. It doesn't decide which one it's going to use. It just tells the server, I know these ones. And you see that they really look confusing. TLS, DHE, RSA, etc. But in fact, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a, a, a really good format for it. So if you have something like this, you can break it down like this. So you got TLS, ECDHE, ECDSA, AS128 GCM, and SHA-265. So what does this mean? Basically, the first part, this one, is used for exchanging key information. I will talk about that later. The second part, if it's there, it's used for authenticating that information. So it's not uh, encrypting it, but it tells you if you know, whatever you sent is valid, yes or no. And this is the actual cipher that's going to be used during your communication. What a lot of people don't realize is that there are two different ways of communicating through an HTTPS connection. One is setting up the secure connection, which is encrypted. But the actual communication between the client and server is encrypted differently. And this is the one that decides which one we'll be using. So in this case, AES-128. And there's a block cipher mode in this case. It's not always the case. And the last one is used for message authenticating. One of the neat functions of TLS is that not only the data is secure over the line, but it's automatically validated. You know, is this what you sent really the thing you sent? So you can't change it one way of the, of the other. Uh, you can also not say, okay, you know, I, I replay uh, uh, things later on. It will actually detect that, and it uses this message authenticating for that. So it's it's, it's really neat. So. This is pretty obvious right now. So we got RSA bit here, we got the AES-265 CBC here, and we use SHA-265 for our message validation. Does anyone know what this would do? It, it would work. It would use null for its, its communication, for its, its, uh, its uh, key authentication, and it would use null for encryption. So basically, you have an unencrypted line, but still you are using HTTPS. <laughs> so please don't try to use this one as a browser and say, you know, this is the only one again, because if the server says, okay, fine, we use this one, then you still have an authenticated communication, but it's not encrypted. And I don't think your browser will say, listen, something fishy is going on. I think it will accept that. Normally, your browsers, your web browsers, won't accept this. So this is only there for mostly debugging purposes and stuff like that. So you're pretty safe if you configure everything <laughs> OK. If you don't configure everything OK, this might work. But most probably you don't. What's really funny is that even though the client, your browser, will say, you know, these are the 20 different cipher suites I know of, it's actually the server that's going to decide which one we will be using. So it could be that you have like a really high uh, grade encryption uh, uh, cipher suite up there and maybe some lower ones down, uh, uh, down as well. Maybe the server can still say, you know what, we're going to use the less secure one. It's totally valid to do that. Actually, I will show you in the example I'm using now. I actually have a, found a site that uses a less secure algorithm uh, cipher suite uh, for that. So 
because the server ultimately decides on which cipher you're going to use, this is really important. Always configure your ciphers on your web server. Always. Don't expect that, oh, you know what, I just installed Nginx or installed Apache and everything works fine. Maybe, but always make sure that your ciphers are in order. So you don't use broken ciphers, cracked ciphers or stuff like that. So how do we do that? Quite easily. You can use these ones for Apache, these ones for Nginx, and everything will be okay. Well, at least for now, probably. Um, there's a website here that shows you a little bit more information about what these ciphers are, what they do, why they are here, and what, uh, what to expect. For instance, you can see here that it doesn't accept our no cipher suite, and the same one here as well. So this means that if you correctly set it up like this, you can't use TLS no with no no, for instance. Uh, slides will be online later on, so you can uh, take a look. If everything I'm going to tell you is really, really boring, and I totally agree with you. I could not stand listening to myself, to be honest. Um, there is one URL you have to remember. It's this one. Anyone know this one? Yeah. It's a website that can test your HTTPS website. You just type in your HTTPS website, and it will give you a breakdown on how secure your site is, what the things are you need to fix, and how to fix them, basically. Really awesome site. OK. Um, Let's get back to the wire sharding. Oh, here we are. So these are the cipher suites. I just sent over a couple of suites, and we see which one is going to be used. That will be used later on. Um, you see that here we get something called extensions. TLS is really awesome because it's got like basic features, which are the cipher suites and the random stuff like that. But you can also add extensions to them. And if both your browser and your server know about a certain extension, they can actually use it. One extension, for instance, is server name. And server name is it's what we call SNI. Uh, you know that if you go to HTTP 1.1, you can have multiple hosts on one IP, right? Um, most of you probably know that you can't do that on HTTPS, right? But with SNI, you can. So SNI allows you to have multiple websites on the same IP through HTTPS. Fortunately, it's not supported always, uh, everywhere, but nowadays it's OK. Um, so that's this extension. Another extension you probably have heard of the last few weeks is the heartbeat extension. Uh, I think there was some kind of bug inside that pretty much um, rendered the whole internet useless, at least, uh, at least uh, the HTTPS part. Uh, it's just an extension. It's one of the, 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 the extensions here, and there was something wrong with it. Uh, so it has nothing to do with TLS by itself. It's just like, you know, PHP extension, uh, the same thing. Um, there's a lot more in here. I'm not going to go over them because it's, it's, it's all too complicated and, and all too difficult to uh, show it you. I just want to show you the SNI. So pretty much every decent browser and server supports it nowadays. Uh, except IE6, Windows XP, BlackBerry, and Android 2.0, so nobody cares, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you want to use SNI nowadays, please go for it, unless you have a really good reason for it. Maybe IE6, but then you have other problems, I think. <laughs> oh, well. So that's the client hello part. So we're still at the beginning, and now we're at 15 milliseconds inside a connection. So all the information has been sent from the browser to the server, and now the server will send something back to the browser. And again, oh, I will show it a little bit to you. So this is like the client hello, and now we get to another part, server hello. And you see here that the server does pretty much the same thing. So we get the handshaking, TLS 1.0, and you see that the handshake protocol itself uses TLS 1.0 again. Very confusing. And some random bytes. So we got the time, random bytes. So now two sites have two different sets of random bytes, right? Session IDs, don't really want to talk about it, but it's like for continuation of uh, TLS traffic. But one cool thing is you see the cipher suite here. 
So pretty much this server decided, okay, you know what? I know which cyber switch you're gonna uh, support. We're gonna use TLS RSA with RC4, 128, MD5. Now, if I go back to the list of cipher tweets, you will see that it starts with the top one. And the top one is the most preferred cipher suite that the client wants to use. So the lower down, the less preferable it is for the client to use that one. So let's take a look where we can find that RSA thingy. Not here, not here, not here, down, down, down. Oh, there it is. It's the bottom one. <laughs> Um, so this server decided to use the least secure <coughs> cypher suite. It actually has got some good reasons for that because this one is very fast considering the top ones. So that's probably the reason why. So you see here that even though I got a whole kind of a whole set of cool cypher suites, it still uses this one. Okay? So back to the server, hello. Next, we come up to, I think for most of you, uh, the most familiar part of dealing with SSL and TLS and HTTPS are the certificates. Anyone dealt with certificates? Yeah, created self-signed certificates maybe. Okay. So, what's happening here is that in this case, it sends a whole list of certificates. And you can see it's a certificate says I am Microsoft.com, it sends another certificate, another one, and another one. So certificates are the way of making sure that the server is who he says he is. You know, you can validate uh, who you're talking to. However, most people um, don't really understand the whole concept behind certificates. An SSL certificate, it is not I'm really an SSL certificate. We still call it SSL certificate, but quite frankly, it should be either called TLS certificate because we're dealing with TLS nowadays. But it's actually called an X509 certificate. That's the format it actually uses. It also is not automatically secure. People think, oh, I've got a certificate, so it's secure. Definitely, it's not the case. It's also not automatically trustworthy. Some people say, you know, I've got a certificate from this uh, agency, so it's much better than your self-signed certificate. That is not the case. Self-signed certificates are just as secure as your certificate you bought from maybe hundreds of dollars per year. Exactly the same security. And obviously, SSL certificates are not cheap. Uh, there are some cheap ones. Uh, if you're going to buy an SSL certificate, if there are no other reasons, get the cheapest one because you don't gain anything with it. If you want to gain like, you know, the green address bar and stuff like that, you might need to pay some more money. But if you don't care about that, get the cheapest one. That, that works most of the time perfectly. So this is what an SSL certificate is not. So what is it? It's at this point the best way to prove authentic authenticity, you know. It's the best way to prove that this server is says who he says he is. It's a way to bootstrap the encrypted communication. We've seen that we're going to use a sort of uh, encryption, but that encryption is, is called symmetrical. Both sides of the aisle need to have the same key. And we send the key over through uh, some information that's stored inside the certificate. It's also very misleading because if you go to any site that sells SSL certificates are the people here who sell them. No, do you raise your hand? No, no problem. 99% on the site is really misleading in this marketing talk. You know, doesn't make any sense at all. And to be honest, for most of the time, it's too expensive as well. So, what's inside such a certificate? First of all, the owner information. Who, who is this owner? Who, who, who am I talking to? Um, domain information, uh, for which domains is this certificate valid for? So you know, for which, uh, uh, um, in this case it was Microsoft.com, but it could be GitHub.com or something else. Expiry information, from when to when is this certificate valid, is also in there as well. So this is why certificate is only valid for one year or two years or five years. It's, 
embedded inside a certificate. Unfortunately, if I have a certificate, who am I just to, you know, get a, an editor up there and change, you know, the expiry date or something like that? Fortunately, you can't. Because what's happening, if you got a certificate, in this case for yourdomain.com, it's signed by somebody else. Does anyone understand the concept of signing? Sort of, not really. When you sign something, you say, okay, whatever is there, I validate it, and this is the proof I have that it's authentic. So what they actually do is they have another certificate. Most of the time, this is called an intermediate certificate. And they're going to use that to actually sign your first certificate. And it's, it's like a signature, you know? It's, it's like I verify that this is correct. And what you can do is a little bit more difficult to explain, but basically you can see when you change information inside the certificate, then the signature will not be correct anymore. So in this case, you can see easily if the certificate is correct, yes or no. But now we have a problem because can't I just change the intermediate CA as well? Well, yes. <laughs> so there we have a root CA. And that root CA actually signs the intermediate CA. So now we have a problem. Can't I change the root CA? Yes. <laughs> well, you see where I'm going to, right? At the end of the line, which there isn't, there is some place where I have to say, okay, you know what? I trust this certificate. No matter what, I will trust it. This is normally the root CA. And this is what we call implied trust. Because we're going to trust certificates that we don't know anything about, but it's uh, incorporated inside our browsers, inside our operating systems. And if that certificate says some other certificate is okay, then we say it's okay. You know, who am I to argue with the root CA? Actually, um, it was actually a Dutch company, so sorry about that, a uh, few years ago, two years, maybe last year, that uh, was a root CA that was hacked. So we couldn't trust that anymore. So all the browsers, all the OSs and everything had to you know, be changed just to get rid of that root CA. So the root CA or the root certificate authorities, they are built inside your browser and OSs and everything, and we automatically trust them. So that's pretty scary because that's the foundation of our encryption. So automatically, you don't want them to be, of, you don't want that many inside your OS, and inside your browser, right? I've checked with, uh, well, you can check it yourself with this command line. Um, this is the um, security system from Mozilla that actually uses, uh, uh, that stores all the um, root certificates that's inside Mozilla, and it's used for other uh, browsers as well. So how many you think will be there? You know, 10 maybe? 50. Yeah, 174. <laughs> so there's 174 companies, and these are not all of them, I assure you, that we don't know anything about. I don't even think people can name more than five, I think, um, that we don't know anything about, but they just sell certificates, and we automatically trust them. So. Um, because they're compiled in. The browser says, oh, this is a root certificate, but, but so we trust them. I, I don't know. It, it might be money, but no, it, it's, I, to be honest, I don't know how they can, I don't know how you can get a, a root certificate accepted, to be honest. I think there are guidelines for that, but I don't know. I don't do root certificates <laughs> myself, so. Um, so yeah, if, if it's one of these 174, your browser will automatically accept your certificate. If it's not one of the 174, for instance, when you self-signed it, so you say, you know, me myself accept this of uh, uh, trust the certificate, then your browser will complain. It will say, hey, I don't trust the certificate. What shall I do with it? And people always click, well, okay, but <laughs> you should be aware of that. That's the difference between self-signed and signing it through a root CA. That's, that's the thing. So the X509 certificates are used to authenticate the server, basically. What people don't know 
is that servers can ask clients to authenticate them as well. Obviously, a browser of a web server won't do that. GitHub doesn't ask uh, you as a client, you know what, I want proof that you are who you say you are. But for instance, what would happen if you create a RESTful service, for instance, and you communicate between you know, two clients, you can actually say to the web servers there, you know, I want to authenticate both sides of them, not only one side, both sides of them. So that's really cool because then we have two-way authentication instead of just one way. So if you do RESTful services or HTTP services over TLS, you know, have them authenticate both ways. So for APIs, this is really, really cool. Okay, so we've done a server hello, we've done a certificate. One thing I didn't show you, but it's very trivial, is a hello done. It says, okay, fine, I'm, I'm done with you know, whatever I want to do. So next up are the simple things. is the client key exchange, the change cipher spec, and the so-called finished package. What's this? So we did the server hello, we did the certificate, we did the server hello done. We go to the client key exchange. Again, TLS 1.0, you see a client key exchange, and you see here an RSA encrypted pre-master secret. This is something that the browser will send out to the server by generating some kind of code, a key, and actually encrypt that with information taken from the certificate. So we can't do this unless we get the certificate first. And this pre-master is a really important number because we're going to use that later on to get all our keys. So it's not our master key, but it's the pre-master key. Okay, this is getting complex. Now we have three types of information. We have a pre-master secret, we have the client random number, and we have the server random number. And both sides of the aisle, the web server and the client, have these three information. What happened next is that it's going to create a master secret from that. It's, it's an algorithm, you can e even look it up in the RFC, it creates a master secret. That's not enough, yes? Yeah, which, which I showed you before. From that master secret, it actually does pretty much the same loop again, but now use the master secret, the server random number, and the client random number, and hustle them into something called a key buffer. So there's a whole lot of things going on. And that key buffer is actually used for creating keys on communicating. And there are six different keys, or kind of keys, that are going to be used a client Mac, a client key, a client IV, and a server Mac, a server key, and a server IV. The Macs are used for authenticating, um, for uh, uh, authenticating the message. I showed you before that uh, TLS can not only encrypt, but also verify data. That's being used by the client Mac and the server Mac. And the client key and the server key are actually used for encrypting data. And the IV is sometimes used for certain uh, cipher suites, but don't have to worry about that. This also implies that we use a different key from sending from the client to the server than we do from the server to the client. If for some reason somebody gets hold of my client key, that means it can encrypt the information from the client to the server, but not from the server to the client. But then again, you have half the data, so maybe that's enough. But still, you know, only half of your uh, encryption is, is broken at that place. So there are two different encryption keys used for both sides. If you want to try something yourself in PHP, I've done it. Um, to be honest, PHP wasn't completely capable of dealing with this. There are some issues in PHP itself that makes that it doesn't work meaning I'm probably the first one who ever created something like this at PHP. Um, but still, you, you can figure out yourself. I've written a little bit of blog about it on, on how it works. Maybe you, know, you get more uh, information uh, from that. So at that point, both sides have all the keys that is needing for communication. But this is still 
all out of the open. Everybody can snoop this information because that's pretty much what I did here. Uh, so everybody can still see that. One of the cool things is that this pre-master secret I see here can only be read, only be decrypted by the web server. Nobody else. Everybody can read this. I can, you know, print it out in a magazine and give it to you. You can't do anything with it. Only when you have the certificate uh, from the server, then you can decrypt this. At the end, we have something called a change cipher spec protocol. This is the part where the server says, you know what, I've done with all the setup. From now on, everything will be encrypted. It will be the last package that will be unencrypted. And you can see it here as well, because at this point, the server sends something else, but Wireshark says, you know, it's, it's encrypted. I, I don't know what's inside it, because it's encrypted, and this is the whole point of encrypting stuff. So at this point, you know, you see it works because Wireshark has no idea. But at the other side, this, kind, uh, this time the server has to do the same thing as well. At this point, the server has all the information as well. So it can say, you know what, I'm going to change my server spec too. And I will say, you know, we're done. So at this point, Hard for me to see it here. This is this one. Here the server says, okay, I'm going to change the cipher spec as well, and I've got some encrypted information for you as well. So now the browser and the server are really laughing their ass off because something is happening and nobody else knows what. But <laughs> this is what's happening. And from this point on, you can see here application data, but it's encrypted. You know, the only thing I know, it's probably HTTP, but what's inside, I don't know. And here as well. And from this point on, all communication will be done encrypted. And it's 200 milliseconds from when I was starting, pretty much on average. So at this point, we can just do our whatever we want to do over TLS. Normally, when you do HTTPS, it will be HTTP traffic. But if you have your own things you want to do over TLS, might as well. TLS is a really simple protocol, and you can do tunnel everything over it what you want. To be honest, I was a bit lying on saying that Wireshark didn't know what's happening inside encrypted uh, things, but that's because Wireshark can decrypt your HTTP traffic. And it does this in a way by, well, you have to enable your browser for that. Because what needs to be done is for Wireshark to know what's going on, is to figure out what is meant with something with the pre-master secret. What is that? What is that number? If you, if you can't tell it uh, to Wireshark, then it doesn't know. But you can decrypt it with something called the SSL keylog file. Now, this is something that is supported by, I think, Firefox and um, uh, Chrome. And if you do this on a Mac, because I have a Mac, uh, set environment setting SSL keylog file to a certain file, it will dump all the information for your SSL uh, uh, connection. So it will dump the pre-master secrets and all kinds of client number stuff. So that information can be picked up by Wireshark and actually decrypted for you. So nobody else can do it, but for you on your own system, you can do it as long as you tell the browser, use this one. And I can demonstrate to you, because I've done that as well. So I've uh, added that environment setting to my uh, system, so it will be um, available. Now, inside Wireshark, I have, of course, SSL, because I haven't renamed it to TLS yet. And I save it in temp read.txt. And if I click OK, then all of a sudden, I will see OK. You remember that after the cipher spec, something else came out, came as well. And that's actually this one. Mm. And now you can see it's actually a handshake protocol called finished. And afterwards, you see here your secure socket layer. So you see application data. But now it can decrypt that, and you can actually see what's going on. Apparently, this is a HTTP protocol getting the FEV icon in this case. So if you're going to debug, 
HTTPS traffic, you can do that quite easily even with Wireshark. So you don't need any Charles proxies or anything complicated to set it up. Just set your environment setting, have Wireshark up and running, and you're done. So this is really cool on, uh, on debugging stuff. I think Firefox and Chrome are, are working. Definitely not Safari, definitely not IE, but maybe others. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you you can do that as well, and then you can do third party as well. Yes, it, it is possible. Okay, so basically this is what's happening in TLS. Not really that complex, right? It still it is complex, but you know it's manageable. Let me put it that way. <laughs> um, TLS has overhead, obviously. Um, but it's definitely worth it, especially, you know, if you do banking, e-commerce, uploading cat pictures, definitely go for HTTPS. Some Cypher suites are better than others, but slower. This is why sometimes servers decide on, you know what, let's do a less secure Cypher suite because it's faster for us, compu compu computational-wise, but, you know, for other reasons as well. So speed security is always a compromise. If you want to figure out how your OpenSSL Cypher suites are uh, running on your own system, you can use OpenSSL tool with speed. It will actually show you all the you know, benchmarks for all the different Cypher suites on your system. So, are we safe yet? I dare you to say yes. But no. No. What happens? That pre-master secret we talked about. What happened? If somebody and I don't going to call any three-letter agencies in America. If somebody got hold of the private key, what happens? You basically can derive all the secrets, right? All the secret files. So people like Pink Floyd and everything, <coughs> what they can do is they can say, you know what? Let's grab all the information we have on the Internet right now, and we store it. I don't know, in a MySQL database. I don't know how they're going to start. And then you just wait until either they're going to crack the private key from somebody or they force the private key from somebody or some other way, find a private key from somebody. At that, at that point, they can crack all the data. And sometimes, you know, you don't care. You know, um, it, it means that last year you uploaded the picture or you did that or you did that. But sometimes, you know, you don't want that. So all the information you store on HTTPS might be safe now, but might not be safe a year, 10 years from now, and could be cracked by then. This is what um, another Cypher suite we've uh, seen before is using. Um, it's something called perfect forwarding secrecy. And perfect forwarding secrecy, actually forwarding secrecy, means that Compromising the pre-master secret does not compromise the compu uh, communication by itself. You still have to do that one by one. Basically, it, it, it's not really 100% correct, but you can see it as like assaulting for your uh, uh, pre-master secret. So it's, it's, it's like assault. Uh, perfect forwarding secrecy means that if you compromise one key, you cannot compromise other keys as well. So PFS, or pre-forwarding secrecy, is something you want to implement on your servers as well, because you know makes things much safer. Unfortunately, PFS needs server and browser support. Now, browser support, until not that long ago, was really crap. Server support wasn't much better. And something like this will show you a little bit. This is like almost a year ago. And you can see that if you're using Safari, then pretty much none of the websites are using actually PFS. They're actually not pre forwarding secret secure. Um, even Firefox and Chrome, they're up at one third of the sites. So one third of the HTTPS sites are configured for perfect warning secrecy. It's not a lot. This is only a year ago. To be honest, I haven't seen uh, the ones uh, this year, but it won't be a little bit better, not much. Um, Safari, Internet Explorer, you're basically on your own at that point. So mm -hmm. it's up to you to use it or not. 
Uh, another site, uh, Internet Explorer, Microsoft doesn't really do perfect forwarding secrecy. Um, however, if you use Nginx, a web server with Firefox, a good time of the uh, number of calls are actually perfect forwarding secrecy enabled. So this is really good. This is why more people are using Nginx than Apache nowadays. So you get you know more stuff and more perfect forwarding secrecy um, automatically with it. So this is what happens when you order the Cypher suites before. I show you the Apache and the Nginx configurations. They are actually configured for doing perfect forwarding secrecy if the browser supports it. If the browser doesn't support it, it tries other Cypher suites that aren't PFS enabled, but still you know, secure enough. But you have to be careful that if you're gonna enable PFS Cypher suites on your system, it's going to be heavy computations because it, it works a little bit different. Uh, so it's going to be much, much harder for your web servers. So if you have a web server already running at 100% at of its power, don't enable PFS because that's not going to work probably. Again, SSL test, the website will show you as well if you have perfect forwarding secrecy enabled and for which browsers it actually is supported because you can enable it for instance Chrome but maybe disable it for IE when it's not supported. <laughs> so every information is there as well. Really awesome site. Okay, too much info. <laughs> not to worry, it's still, uh, it's still late. Um, if you want to know how can I securely set up my web server, again, SSL Labs, the website, there's a best practices URL and it gives you all the information. It will tell you what to do. It will also tell you what not to do. Because sometimes things might see, may, make sense, like uh, getting certificates for 4096 uh, bytes, for instance, doesn't make sense. It will say it, and it will say why it doesn't make sense, etc. So you can actually have a lot of information in there uh, to set up your web server as well. So definitely, if you're going to set it up, take a look at this site. <sighs> Questions, does, does the, the handshaking occur every time you do a request? No, it will do that when it's a new connection. However, when you, you know, do a second connection, get, get a second image or whatever, it has a, a, a session ID, like a session token that resumes. Still, there's a little bit of overhead, but not as much as you see, uh, see here. 200 milliseconds is, is a lot. Um, yes, um, I agree with you. Um, well, there are some tweaks. One of the most uh, used tweaks is get a, 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 a faster but less secure cyber suite because then the computations aren't that much and you can actually use uh, uh, less time. Um, so um, apart from that, there isn't really a lot. I think the new TLS um, versions will have, have more speed like, like what we do with speedy and everything. They want to do it in, in TLS as well, but for the moment, no, that's, that's it. But a proxy server is still secure because you have to manually upload the private key to that proxy server. A proxy server by itself cannot do that. You have to enforce it, the proxy server, to actually be able to uh, uh, decrypt the data. It cannot do that by itself. The same as Wireshark, it cannot do it by itself, but if I tell them to do it, like I did with the, the environment setting, then it can. So it's still safe, but you manually you can overrule that for mostly development purposes, obviously. The session ID is safe because you, you do authentication of it as well. So you have the signing of the uh, uh, information before it actually resumes something. So it, it's not that you can just send over a session ID and you know what, just start again. You have to prove as a client that you are the owner of the session ID, basically. So it's yeah, it, it's safe. May, maybe not an SSL 1.0 or something, but <laughs> I don't know. But in TLS, it's, it's safe, yes. Um, yeah, wh why doesn't multiple uh, hosts on one IP doesn't work on HTTPS, you mean? Um, the thing is, it doesn't work on HTTP as well because you connect to a website, but basically you're connecting to an IP address, right? Um, what HTTP 1.1 does is say, you know, I want to get this URL, 
but this is the host I want to connect to. But you can't do that on HTTPS because HTTPS is encrypted and it doesn't know which server you need to go to because the HTTP is encrypted. So basically the SNI extension is, is much, <coughs> much like the host header in HTTP. It, it uses the same way. Yeah. Only it's not really supported from the beginning, so it's, it's an extension and, and not everybody supports it. But nowadays, name virtual host with the host name isn't supported on webs on clients that, that only support HTTP 1.0, but nobody cares. So the same thing here as well. Okay, clear? Any more? Okay, cool. If you want to have more information about, well, me, hopefully, but from SSL talk as well, um, here's the information about me, Twitter. Um, I have some blog posts as well. Take a look at the TLS stuff I did in PHP. It's, it's really funny, I think. Uh, and you can email me as, as well. All right, thank you. Thank you.